Hello everyone and welcome to the Unanswered Questions True Crime Podcast. I have spent hours and hours investigating this. He basically told her that people have been killed. Journalists, independent investigators, people like that disappeared. It frightened her to the bone. There's more to the story than meets the eye. There were rumors of torture and homicide and sexual abuse, all sorts of egregious, horrendous crimes. He was polygraphed three times. Each of those three showed evasions. His resumes were a skeleton of truth. He was mad at the world, and particularly mad at the government. The study that he commissioned that described a fictional terrorist attack. If people have died over this, it means you're getting close to the truth. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to say, what the fuck? Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy and as always let me some feedback on what you think about the show and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about the Alphabet Murders, which is also known as the Double Initial Murders, which are an unsolved series of child murders which occurred between 1971 and 1973 in Rochester, New York. Sorry if I get that name wrong. All three victims were girls aged 10 or 11 whose surname began with the same letter as that of her first name. Each victim had been sexually assaulted and murdered by either manual or ligature strangulation before her body was discarded in or near a town or village near Rochester with a name beginning with the same letter as the victim's name. Now we're going to get into the murders. First off, we have Carmen Colon. At 4.20pm on November 16th of 1971, a 10-year-old Puerto Rican child named Carmen Colon disappeared while returning home from an errand in Rochester, New York. According to eyewitnesses, Colon entered the pharmacy her grandmother had instructed her to visit on West Main Street, but left the store upon learning the prescription she had been instructed to collect had not been processed. Informing the store owner, Jack Corbin, quote, I got to go, I got to go, end quote. She was then observed entering a car park close to the pharmacy. Colin was reported missing to the Rochester Police Department at 7.50pm. Approximately 15 minutes after Colin exited the pharmacy, scores of motorists driving along Interstate 490 observed the child, naked from the waist down, running from a reversing vehicle believed to be a dark-coloured Ford Pinto hatchback, frantically waving her arms and shouting in an attempt to flag down a passing vehicle. At least one of these witnesses observed Colin being submissively led back to this vehicle by her abductor. Two days later, two teenage boys discovered Colin's partially nude body in a gully not far from Interstate 490 and close to the village of Churchville. This location was approximately 12 miles from where Colin had last been seen alive. Her coat discovered in a culvert some 300 feet from her body. Her trousers were only discovered on November 30th close to the service road near where numerous motorists had observed her attempting to escape her abductor. An autopsy revealed that in addition to having been raped, the child had suffered a fracture to her skull in one of her vertebrae before she had been manually strangled to death. Furthermore, her body had been extensively scratched by fingernails. Both the murder of Colin and the fact that no individual who had observed the child attempting to flee from her abductor alongside Interstate 490 had attempted to offer her any assistance generated intense public outrage. Two New York newspapers, the Times Union and the Democrat and Chronicle, initially offered a combined reward of $2,500 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of a murderer and all information each publication received was relayed to police. Numerous local businesses and residents added private donations to the reward fund, gradually leading the sum to exceed $6,000. Although police interrogated several suspects in the months following Colin's murder, all were cleared of involvement and by December 21st, the number of investigators assigned to the case on a full-time basis was decreased to three. In early 1972, five large billboards, each measuring 30 feet by 12 feet, were erected alongside major Rochester expressways. Each bore an 8-foot, 2.4-meter-high picture of the child alongside the headline, quote, Do you know who killed Carmen Colon? Free use of these billboards was given for one month by the Rochester Outdoor Advertising Company. Each offered a $6,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Colon's murderer or murderers, in addition to displaying the telephone hotline number and postal address each established the previous November to encourage the public to submit anonymous information. Although this tactic generated several new leads, all failed to bear fruit. Now we get into the second murder, that being Wanda Wokowitz. Sorry if I get that name wrong. 
17 months later, at approximately 5pm on April 2nd of 1973, 11-year-old Wanda Walkowitz disappeared from the east side of Rochester while returning home from an errand. According to the owner of the delicatessen, Walkowitz had been instructed to visit. The child had purchased the groceries she had been instructed to buy at approximately 5.15pm before she had begun walking home alone down Conkey Avenue. Walkowitz was reported missing by her mother Joyce at 8pm. Police immediately launched an intense search to locate Walkowitz. Almost 50 detectives searched several square miles of the terrain around her home, the Delicatessen, and areas around the Janice River where she had been known to play. These searches failed to locate the child, although several neighborhood residents recalled observing Walkowitz struggling to carry the bag of groceries, walking just north of Avenue B. Three classmates specifically observed her bracing the bag against a fence so that she could improve her grip as a brown vehicle drove past her. Walkowitz's fully clothed body was found by a police officer at 10.15am the following day, discarded at the base of a hillside alongside an access road to State Route 104 in Webster, approximately 7 miles, 11 kilometres from Rochester. The position of her body indicated she'd likely been thrown from a moving vehicle, with her body rolling down the embankment. An autopsy revealed she'd been sexually assaulted, then strangled from behind with a ligature, most likely a belt. Several defensive wounds indicated Walkowitz had fought her murderer. In addition, her body had been redressed after death. The autopsy also revealed traces of semen and pubic hair upon the child's body. Furthermore, several strands of white cat fur were found upon her clothing, although the Walkowitz family did not own a pet with a fur of this colour. As had been the case with Carmen Colon, investigators established an anonymous telephone hotline in addition to distributing numerous flyers throughout Rochester appealing for information. A reward of $10,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Walkowitz's murderer was also established. These police inquiries produced an eyewitness who informed investigators that as Walkowitz had walked home from the delicatessen on the evening of April 2nd, he had observed the child standing alongside the passenger door of a large brown vehicle conversing with the driver. This eyewitness was unable to obtain a clear view of the occupant of the vehicle, although the location of the sighting was just two-tenths of a mile from the Walkowitz home. Another individual who contacted investigators following the installation of the anonymous hotline informed investigators she'd observed a man forcing a redhead girl matching Walkowitz's description into a light-coloured Dodge Dart on Conkey Avenue between 5.30pm and 6pm on the evening of her disappearance. The Rochester Police Department dismissed any suggestion of a link between the murders of Colin and Walkowitz, although a sheriff sergeant who'd been assigned to investigate Colin's murder, by this stage still an open, although largely inactive case, was reassigned to the task force implemented to investigate the murder of Walkowitz. In September 1973, local television network WOKR announced plans to broadcast a televised reconstruction of Walkowitz's abduction and subsequent recovery of her body. This 30-minute episode was broadcast on the 21st of October, accompanied by public appeals for witnesses to contact authorities. Although this program resulted in the Rochester Police Department receiving over 200 calls from the public, no useful leads were gained. Now we come to the third and final murder, that being Michelle Mainzer. Seven months later, on the evening of November 26, 1973, 11-year-old Michelle Mainzer was reported missing by her mother Carolyn after she failed to return home from school. Subsequent investigations were determined Mainzer was last seen by her classmates at approximately 3.20pm, walking along en route to a shopping plaza located close to her school with the intention of retrieving a purse her mother had left inside a store within the plaza earlier that day. Approximately 10 minutes later, a witness observed Mainzer sitting in a passenger seat of a beige or tan vehicle traveling at high speed on Ackerman Street before turning into Webster Avenue. According to this witness, the child had been weeping. At 5.30pm on November 26, the motorist observed a man standing by a large beige or tan vehicle with a flat tyre parked alongside Route 350 in the town of Walworth, holding a girl he strongly believed to be Michelle Mainzer by the wrist. When this motorist had stopped to offer assistance, the individual had deliberately grabbed the girl and pushed her behind his back, also obscuring his license plate from the motorist's view as he stared in his direction with such a menacing expression on his face that the motorist had felt compelled to drive away. Mainz's fully clothed body was discovered at 10.30am on November 28th, lying face down in a ditch alongside a rural road in Macdon, approximately 15 miles, 24 kilometres from Rochester. Her autopsy revealed that in addition to receiving extensive blunt force trauma to her body, Mainzer had been raped, then strangled to death from behind with a ligature, possibly a thin rope. Numerous strands of white cat fur were discovered upon her clothing, and leaf samples matching the foliage where her body was discovered were recovered from within one of her 
clenched hands, indicating she'd likely been strangled to death at or near the location where she was found. Investigators were able to retrieve a partial palm print from her neck and traces of semen upon her body and underwear. A forensic analysis of the semen samples determined she'd been raped by one individual. An analysis of the contents of Mays' stomach revealed traces of a hamburger and onions which had been consumed approximately one hour before her murder, giving credence to earlier reports of a girl matching Mays' description having been seen in the company of a Caucasian man with dark hair, aged between 25 and 35, approximately 6 foot 0 inches, 1.83 meters tall, and weighing 165 pounds or 75 kilos, both at a fast food restaurant in the town of Penfield at approximately 4.30 p.m. on the afternoon of her disappearance, and alongside Route 350 approximately one hour later. Now we get into the funerals of the girls. Carmen Colon, Wanda Walkowitz, and Michelle Mainzer were each laid to rest in Rochester's Holy Sipcure Cemetery. I'm sorry if I get that name wrong. Colon's funeral was conducted on November 22nd of 1971. Her funeral mass was attended by 200 mourners. Walkowitz was laid to rest on April 6th of 1973. She was laid to rest in a small white and gold casket following a service officiated by the Reverend Benedict Emmon. Sorry if I get that name wrong. Mainz's funeral was held at the Corpus Christi Church on December 1st of 1973. Her open casket funeral service was attended by scores of mourners. At the conclusion of Michelle's funeral service, her father Christopher Mainz stated to the other mourners, quote, She was a sweet little girl. She didn't fight much. End quote. Now we get into the investigation. All three child murders generated intense public outrage. Each received intense publicity, and following the murder of Michelle Mainza, investigators released a composite drawing of the individual seen with a child by numerous witnesses to the media. They also installed a telephone hotline exclusively devoted to the manhunt for the perpetrator, whom they strongly suspected had committed all three murders. Anonymity was again offered to any caller offering information, and a reward was again offered for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the perpetrator. Trader. Although these efforts resulted in numerous calls from the public, no credible suspect was located. Although investigators interrogated more than 800 potential suspects in relation to the alphabet murders, the perpetrator or perpetrators of the homicides was never caught, and the case remains unsolved, as each child held from a poor Catholic family, had few friends, and had recently experienced issues such as bullying or poor academic performance at her school. Investigators have not discounted the possibility the murderer may have been employed by or held knowledge of the practices of a social service agency in his efforts to initiate contact with and or gain the trust of each victim. Now we get into the similarities in this case. The three young girls that fell victim to the double initial killer all shared several similar traits. These include that all three girls' first name and surname started with the same letter, all three were a similar age, all three came from Catholic families, all three struggled at school, all three were from poor neighbourhoods. Their murders also shared common factors. These were that all three were found in a rural area, all three were discovered in a city that matched the letter of their name, and all three were sexually assaulted and strangled. All three victims were pre-adolescent females who had disappeared from Rochester in the early afternoon on days of light or heavy rain and whose bodies were later discovered within nearby towns. The body of each girl had been discovered either fully clothed or partially clothed close to an expressway at a location typically accessible by vehicle and each victim had evidently been thrown from or carried from a car to the location her body had been discarded. Each child was short in height, and all three girls had been raped before being strangled to death. In addition, all three were known to be viewed as somewhat lonely outcasts among their peers. Furthermore, an analysis of the stomach contents of both Wachowitz and Mainzer revealed both girls had ingested food shortly before their death, which neither girl is known to have eaten prior to her disappearance, and the bodies of both girls had been redressed after death. Both contemporary and current investigators have stated the possibility each victim had been selected due to the double initials of her name is extremely unlikely, as for an offender to pre-select his victims for this incidental reason would likely involve his stalking his victim over an extensive period of time, thus increasing the risk of his being noticed. Furthermore, some investigators believe that although the murders of Walkowitz and Mainzer may have been committed by the same individual who had lured the girls to their deaths, the overall modus operandi, or MO, of the murder of Carmen Colon strongly indicates her murder had been committed by an individual known and possibly related to her as opposed to an individual unknown to her who had abducted her by force. 
Now we get into the suspects in this case. First, we have Miguel Colon. In the case of Carmen Colon, her uncle Miguel Colon is considered by investigators to be a strong suspect in her murder. Miguel was the brother of Colon's father, Justin Nano. I'm sorry if I get that name wrong. Following the separation of Colon's parents, he had formed a relationship with her mother, Gularimina, becoming known to Colon as Uncle Miguel. I'm sorry if I get that name wrong. Typically, on occasions, Colon walked to the pharmacy to collect family prescriptions. She'd been accompanied by her grandfather, Felix, although on the date of her disappearance, Colin had pleaded with her grandparents to be allowed to walk to the pharmacy unaccompanied. Just weeks prior to Colin's abduction and murder, her uncle is known to have purchased a car closely matching the vehicle seen by eyewitnesses reversing upon Interstate 490 in pursuit of the child. Investigators did conduct a search of this vehicle shortly after Colin's murder, discovering the interior and exterior of the car had been extensively cleaned and the trunk had been washed with a strong cleaning solution. Questioning of the dealership, which had recently sold the vehicle to Miguel, revealed that the trunk had not been washed with a detergent prior to sale. More Moreover, a doll belonging to the child was found in his car, although Colin's relatives informed investigators she had frequently travelled in Miguel's vehicle and may have left the toy in his car. Furthermore, according to a friend, two days after the death of his niece, Miguel had informed him of his intention to leave the country as he had done something wrong in Rochester. He relocated from Rochester to Puerto Rico just four days after the murder of his niece. Investigators did travel to San Juan to question Miguel in March of 1972, although local newspapers published articles detailing police intentions to question him, resulting in Miguel fleeing from authorities. Miguel surrendered to authorities on March 26th and agreed to be extradited back to Rochester to face questioning. Michael Miguel Colon was unable to provide a credible alibi for his movements on the date of his niece's murder, and no individual could be located to corroborate his claims regarding his whereabouts. Despite strong circumstantial evidence attesting to Miguel's guilt, no physical evidence was located at the crime scene or within his vehicle to link him to the murder. Miguel Colon committed suicide in 1991 at the age of 44, following an incident of domestic violence in which he shot and wounded both his wife and his brother. Then we come to the second suspect in the case, that being Dennis Tumini. One individual considered a strong suspect in the alphabet murders is a 25-year-old Rochester firefighter named Dennis Tumini. Tumini was a prolific serial offender known as the Garage Rapist, who is known to have committed a minimum of 14 rapes of teenage girls and young women between 1971 and 1973. He is also known to have owned a beige colour vehicle, similar in description to the vehicle observed by several eyewitnesses to the abductions. Moreover, he's known to have lived in an address on Box Street, an address close to the area of victim Michelle Manza had last been seen alive. Five weeks after the death of the final victim of the Alphabet murders on January 1st of 1974, Tamini is known to have attempted to abduct a teenage girl at gunpoint, although he fled the scene when the teenager refused to cease screaming. Shortly thereafter, he abducted another potential victim, although on this occasion he was pursued by police, culminating in Tamini committing suicide by shooting himself in the head. A subsequent forensic examination of Tamini's vehicle did reveal traces of white cat fur upon the upholstery. In January 2007, Tamini's body was exhumed to obtain a DNA sample for comparison with the semen samples recovered from Walkowitz's body. The results of this test confirmed Tamini was not responsible for her murder, however no physical evidence retrieved from the bodies of Colin or Mainza exists for comparison with Tamini's DNA. Then we have the third suspect, which is Kenneth Bianchi. Sorry if I get that name wrong. Another suspect in the Alphabet murders is serial killer Kenneth Bianchi, who at the time of the murders worked as an ice cream vendor in Rochester. He's known to have worked at locations close to the first two murder scenes. Bianchi had relocated from Rochester to Los Angeles in January 1976. Between 1977 and 1978, he and his cousin Angelo Bruno Jr. committed the infamous Hillside Strangler murders of 10 girls and young women between the ages of 12 and 28. And she was never charged with the alphabet murders and has vehemently denied any culpability in the homicides. He has repeatedly attempted to have investigators officially clear him of suspicion. However, while residing in Rochester, he's known to have driven a vehicle of the same colour and model as a vehicle seen near one of the abduction sites. 
Then we come to the final suspect in the case, Joseph Nazo. In April 2011, a 77-year-old named Joseph Nazo was arrested in Reno, Nevada for the murders of four women in California committed between 1977 and 1994, all of whom are believed to have been prostitutes and each of whose surname began with the same letter as that of her first name. Nazo was a New York native who had lived in Rochester during the early 1970s and is known to have regularly travelled between New York and California. Initially described by authorities as a person of interest in the alphabet murders, DNA testing has confirmed Nazo's DNA is not a match to the semen samples recovered from the body of Wanda Wokowitz. Nazo was brought to trial on June 18th of 2013, charged with the murder of the four California alphabet murder victims. He was unanimously convicted of each murder on August 20th, and on November 22nd of 2013, Nazo was formally sentenced to death. Now we get into the aftermath. In 1995, the mother of Carmen Colon made her first public statement regarding the murder of her daughter. In this interview, granted to Democrat and Chronicle reporter Jack Jones, Guillermina Colon stated that although she'd lived her entire life in poverty, if she could have only one thing before her own death, it would not be wealth, but knowing who had murdered her daughter. Adding, quote, If I could die knowing who killed my Carmesita, I could die more peacefully than I have lived. It is the only thing I want in my life, to know that this person had to pay for the terrible things he did to my little girl. If the person who did this could have any compassion, he would see the pain and suffering the families of these little girls have gone through for all this time." End quote. The Democrat and Chronicle newspaper published a series of articles focusing upon the ongoing police investigation into the alphabet murders in 2009, appealing for the public information with a view to closing the case. These articles resulted in the Rochester Police Department receiving approximately 20 new leads of inquiry. Although all leads received were pursued, none resulted in the apprehension and convictions of the perpetrator or perpetrators, and nonetheless, a police spokesperson has stated the Rochester Police Department remains committed to solving this case. As of 2023, this case remains unsolved, and the murderer has never been caught. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remain unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I've covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to have a look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time. Next, on Unanswered Questions. Now, Odessa is an American codename meaning organization of former SS member coined in 1946 to cover Nazi underground escape plans at the end of World War II by a group of SS officers with the aim of facilitating secret escape routes and any directly ensuing arrangements. 